And thanks to Mike and Philip and Alina for putting the series together. It's a great pleasure to speak in the series. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is uh, some methods for determining rational points on curves. And I'd like to illustrate each of the methods with a prototypical curve that you might want to consider. And so all of these techniques share in common some piatic methods, um, and I'll kind of start from the ground up and um, build our way to some interesting curves that we'll look at. So the first question uh, comes to us from a question about rational triangles. So we say that a rational triangle is one with sides that are all rational. So we can ask then if there exists a rational right triangle and a rational isosceles triangle that have the same perimeter and the same area. And this might seem like a question that the ancient Greeks looked at, you know, maybe one that um, we've known the answer to for quite a long time, but it turns out that this was just looked at very recently uh, by two graduate students in Japan, uh, Keio University, Hirakawa and Matsumura, uh, in 2018. So <clears throat> this will lead us to a question about a particular genus two curve. So I thought we'd take a look at their solution. So we'll assume that there is such a pair of triangles, a rational right triangle and a rational isosceles triangle. And so we rescale and we can assume that their lengths look like the following. So for the rational right triangle, 2kt, k times 1 minus t squared, k times 1 plus t squared, where k is a positive rational and t is a rational between 0 and 1. And for the rational isosceles triangle, 1 plus u squared, 1 plus u squared, and for u, for u between 0 and 1 and rational. All right, so we've set up our two triangles. And now the question was, can they have the same area and the same perimeter? So we compute and we compare their perimeters and areas. And now we have two equations and three unknowns in kt and u. And then we do a small change of coordinates and find ourselves looking at a genus two curve. So the question now about our rational triangles is about rational points on this genus two curve given by the following equation, y squared equals this cubic squared minus 8x to the sixth. So here is our first curve that we'd like to look at. So what can we say about rational points on this curve? All right, so something very special happens uh, and the chabotie coleman bound kicks in and it tells us that this particular genus two curve has at most 10 rational points. So this is incredible. And I'll tell you where this comes from and why it applies in a moment, but we'll hold on to that for now. And since we know that this curve has at most 10 rational points, let's try to find some rational points in this curve. So, you know, we search in a box, you know, maybe you write a little script to try to find some points of small height. And when we do that, well, there are a number of rational points. And in fact, there are 10 rational points. So this is great. We've determined the set of rational points on this curve. So from the point of view of this question, we've now found what we can say about our triangles. And if we trace through the different coordinates, uh, we find that the one point with x coordinate 12 over 11 and positive y coordinate gives rise to a pair of triangles. So we've answered this question about triangles using the chabotie coleman bound on this genus two curve. And this is the theorem of Hirakawa and Matsumura that up to similitude, there exists a unique pair of a rational right triangle and a rational isosceles triangle that have the same perimeter and the same area. All right, so you might be wondering about the chabotie coleman method, which is what allowed us to compute the set of rational points in the previous example. So that's what I'd like to talk about next. Uh, so it implied for this curve that there were at most 10 rational points. And behind the scenes, crucially, we satisfied an inequality between the genus of the curve, which is two, and the rank of the Mordell Vey group of its Jacobian, which we were able to compute and find out that it was one. All right, and since that applied, we were able to apply 
some work of Chabotty that was later reinterpreted by Coleman to get an effective bound that turned out to be sharp. And that's a bit of luck that's involved for this particular curve. So you know, there's some choice of prime. This is a piatic method, and there's some choice of prime that's, uh, that you're using behind the scenes. So I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. All right, so maybe to just give a little bit more context about why we care about questions like this. So faultings prove Mordell's conjecture, and so we know that if we have a smooth projective curve X over the rationals of genus at least two, then the set of rational points is finite. But faultings proof doesn't give us an algorithm to determine the set of rational points. Now, there's another proof of finiteness due to Voida, but it also doesn't give us an algorithm for finding the set of rational points. There is recent work of Lawrence and Bankatesh that also gives another proof of finiteness. And here it remains to be seen if this can be made algorithmic. Uh, but what we do have that works in some cases is the method of Shabuchi and Coleman. So it only applies to curves satisfying a certain restrictive rank bound. Uh, but then when it does apply, it works very well in practice for determining rational points, possibly combined with other methods. And that's our motivating problem, to look at the method of Shabuchi Coleman or possibly other refinements of this to give an explicit version of Faulting's theorem. So if I give you a curve defined over the rationals, and I know that its genus is at least two, to compute explicitly the set of its rational points. All right. So here is one more example, one more curve. Uh, so this is a smooth plane quartic, reasonably nice coefficients. So you know, maybe this is some random curve that we'd like to look at, but maybe not. Uh, <laughs> so it's not so random, but we would like to look at it. This is the split Carton modular curve of level 13. And there are some interesting consequences for knowing its rational points from the question of Sarah, and I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. This will be the third curve that we look at. Uh, what we do know about this is that Galbraith did some searching and found seven rational points. And of course, that then leads to the natural question, if that's everything, is the set of these seven points precisely the set of rational points, or were there more just kind of beyond the range that he considered? And we'll answer this at the very end. All right, so maybe just a little bit of setup for working with higher genus curves. So for curves over the rationals of genus at least two, the set of rational points is just a set. So we need to have a little bit more structure to say something about rational points. And so what we do is we associate to our curve other geometric objects that do have extra structure. So in all of this, I'll assume that our set of rational points is not empty, and I'll fix one point, I'll fix a base point, and use that to embed the curve into its Jacobian. I'll do that using this Abel Jacobi map iota that sends a point P to the class of the divisor, P minus B. And then the Mordell Vey theorem tells us that the group of rational points in the Jacobian is finitely generated, so we know it's isomorphic to R copies of Z, plus some torsions and finite abelian group. And here, the rank, this is very important for us often, we'll need to know what it is before we can even start. But I just want to emphasize that this is also something that's very hard to compute. And typically, we get it through some oracle, like magma. Uh, but in general, this is also something that's really difficult to compute. And we don't have an algorithm that will compute this in general. But in all of what we do, we kind of assume that we're handed the rank and that we can proceed. All right. So the idea, the main idea behind all the methods that I'll talk about uh, is to associate either one or maybe a collection of other geometric objects to our curve and then use that to explicitly compute a slightly larger but very importantly finite set of piatic points containing the set of rational points. And then from that finite set of piatic points, use that to extract the set of rational points. And this is what the Shabuchi Coleman method does. And in subsequent years, there are various refinements of this method that allow us to consider other curves of slightly higher rank. Uh, so by associating covering collections, or maybe maps to elliptic curves over higher degree number fields, something known as elliptic Shabuchi. 
But there's also a very large generalization of all of this. Uh, this is a program initiated by Min Young Kim, where instead of just considering the Jacobian and abelian geometric objects, uh, he considers non-abelian geometric objects associated to the curve. And this leads to a non-abelian version of the Shabuti method, a non-abelian Shabuti program. And the hope is that this will allow us to understand rational points on curves whose Jacobians have higher rank. So beyond the frontier of what's possible with the shabuti coleman method. All right. So let's start with Shabuti's theorem. So Shabuti proved the following special case of Mordell's conjecture in the 1940s. Show that if X is a curve of genus at least two over the rationals and the Mordell V rank is less than G, then the set of rational points is finite. And in the 1980s, Coleman gave a theory of piatic line integration and a number of spectacular applications of this theory. And one application that he gave was a reinterpretation of the method of Shabuti. So he gave an effective version of Shabuti's result by reinterpreting everything in terms of piatic line integrals. Uh, he constructed a certain annihilating regular one form and computed its integral and show that this really annihilated rational points. So the rational points had to occur as solutions to this integral of an annihilating regular one form set equal to zero. And he did more than that. He was able to count the number of zeros, this piatic integral, and in doing so, he gave this bound that for a good prime greater than 2g, the number of rational points is bounded above by the number of fp rational points plus 2g minus 2. So this bound comes from studying the number of zeros of a p-adic power series, but also using some global information about this differential that he constructed. All right, so here's a little bit more about the method of Shabuti and Coleman. So we'll fix a prime of good reduction for our curve. I'll assume that it's greater than two. And then remember we had the Abel Jacobi map, iota that embedded our curve X into its Jacobian J. And so that induces a map between the spaces of regular one forms in the Jacobian and the curve. And in fact, this is an isomorphism of G-dimensional piatic vector spaces. So we'll suppose that we have a regular one form on the Jacobian omega J, and that it restricts to regular one form omega on the curve. All right, now we have a piatic integral on the Jacobian. The Jacobian over QP is a piatic Lie group and so naturally carries piatic integrals. And we'll use that to define a piatic integral on the curve. So I want to define the piatic integral on the curve between points Q and Q prime on the curve in terms of this piatic integral on the Jacobian. So we'll define it to be the integral between zero and the class of the divisor Q prime minus Q. All right, and then if the rank of the Jacobian is less than G, the claim is that there exists a regular one form such that the integral between our base point and any rational point of this differential omega vanishes on all rational points. All right, so why, why should this be true? Well, the Jacobian, uh, we said this is a the genus G curve, and so the space of regular one forms is G dimensional. And if the Jacobian has rank R, essentially we have R independent linear conditions. And so if G is greater than R, then we have some positive co-dimension in the space um, that we're, we're trying to cut out using the conditions coming from the rank. And so if R is less than G, then we can construct at least one annihilating differential. And so just using the linear algebra, using the values of the Coleman integrals coming from each piece of rank, we can then compute the kernel of the corresponding matrix and then compute a basis uh, for the space of annihilating differentials. So this really is now a linear algebra problem if we're able to compute values of these Coleman integrals on each of the independent points in the Jacobian. So if we're able to do that, then we can construct a basis for the space of annihilating differentials and then study the corresponding zeros of those integrals and then find a finite set of chaotic points containing the set of rational points on that curve. All right, so just to kind of recap what's happened so far, 
if we have our curve of genus at least two, we're going to embed it inside its Jacobian. And if the rank of the Jacobian is less than G, then we're going to use the Chabotis colon method to compute a regular one form whose chiatic Coleman integral vanishes on rational points. Coleman computed uh, an upper bound for the number of zeros of this chiatic integral and showed that if the prime is greater than 2G and if the prime is good, then the number of rational points is bounded above by the number of FP points plus 2G minus two. So this is first a local computation in each residue disk and then globally using Lima rock, we get this bound. Now, in practice, this can be sharp. So in the triangle example, the genus was two, the rank was one, and behind the scenes, we picked five, and that gave us eight F5 rational points. And putting that all together, we got this upper bound of 10. But you know that there's some dependence here on the prime P, right? And we kind of understand how the number of FP rational points on our curve grows as P grows, is linear in P. So we want to pick this p to be as small as possible, essentially, so that we have the best shot at getting a good upper bound. Uh, but in practice, it isn't always going to be a sharp upper bound. So you compute whatever you can on the right-hand side, and then you do a search on the left-hand side for the points of bounded height, but you might have some discrepancy, right? And it might just be because genuinely there is some difference between the size of the set of piatic points cut out by these intervals and the number of rational points you have. But there's even when that, yeah. Uh, so there's a question in the audience, from the audience. Um, Rasima Kumar, please mm -hmm. unmute and ask away. No, in the second point, uh, the number of points, uh, the FP rational points on X, is it for a specific P or is it holds for all P? What is the, what is, I mean, what is the P? Thanks. So this is the P that you choose. Uh, P has to be a prime of good reduction. And also it has to be larger than two times the genus of the curve. But then this is true for any such P. And you get to pick. Ah, okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? No, I don't think so. You can continue, Jennifer. Okay, thanks. All right, so when there is some discrepancy between an upper bound that you compute and kind of the size of the known rational points that you have, it, it might seem that all hope is lost, but in practice, there is a good method of sieving. So you kind of do a little bit more work and then throw all this into the more invasive. Uh, so you compute Shabuchi Coleman data at a number of primes. You carry out the Shabuchi Coleman method for a collection of favorable primes, and then uh, use conditions on the Jacobian at these various primes to then sieve out the fake points, the points that are not honestly rational. And in practice, this works quite well to then give you the set of rational points. All right, so what we're trying to compute in the Shabuchi Coleman method is the following. So we construct an annihilating differential omega, and then we want to compute all piatic points on the curve z for which the integral vanishes. And we're going to call that set of piatic points xqp1. All right, so we want to do two things. We want to compute this annihilating differential omega, or maybe a collection of annihilating differentials, and then the finite set of piatic points xqp1. So I thought I'd try to make this as explicit as possible to kind of convince you that we can compute these objects. Uh, so this is the case of genus two and rank one. And we'll assume that uh, we have at least one rational point on our curve and we'll fix the base point V. So genus two, we have a two dimensional space of regular one forms. We'll call the basis elements omega naught and omega one. And since the rank is one, which is less than two by setup, we know that we can compute this set xqp1 as the zero set of the piatic integral. So the next point isn't essential, but it just kind of helps simplify some of the computations. So if we know one more rational point p for which the divisor p minus b is not torsion in the Jacobian, so it gives us a point of infinite order in the Jacobian, then we can compute these two integrals, the Coleman integral uh, between p and b of omega naught and the Coleman integral between p and b of omega one. That gives us two p-adic numbers, a and b, 
And then that gives us the constraints that we need to construct our annihilating differential. Right? So taking, for instance, B omega naught minus A omega one gives us an annihilating differential. And then that uh, is what we want to integrate and find all points Z for which that vanishes. And so maybe I should say a little bit about uh, computing these intervals. So for hyperelliptic curves, this is something that you can use SAGE to compute these numbers A and B. And for more general curves, uh, there is a package that Jan Taupman and I uh, put on GitHub to compute these values of Coleman integrals. So if you need to compute Coleman integrals either for this or for other purposes, I encourage you to check out those two software libraries and uh, let me know, uh, especially if you find any bugs. So in any case, if you're able to compute these numbers, then you're able to compute the set of p-adic points uh, for which the interval vanishes, and then you're able to compute the set xqp1. So from that, you might have to do a little bit more work to compute the set of rational points, but hopefully things like the more delvasive will kick in and then you can determine the set of rational points. All right, so we've talked a little bit about finding rational points on curves. Um, but maybe there's another question of which curves do we actually wanna do this sort of thing for? And well, sometimes we would like to look at curves that have been uh, mysterious for a number of years. And so one particular curve that was difficult for many years was a curve that appeared in the Arithmetica. So Diophantus posed the following question. Uh, so to find three squares, which when added give a square, and such that the first one is the side or the square root of the second, and the second is the side of the third. So if we put this all together, Diophantus is asking if we can find positive rational x and y such that the equation y squared equals x to the eighth plus x to the fourth plus x squared is satisfied. And Diophantus found a solution. So he gave x is one half and y is nine sixteenth. So from Diophantus's point of view, he was done. He solved this problem. But from our point of view, we'd like to see if uh, we can find all of the rational points on this curve. So let's remove the singularity of the curve at zero, zero. So this amounts to determining the set of all rational points on our next curve now, this genus two curve with affine model y squared equals x to the sixth plus x squared plus one. So one reason this curve is very nice is because it's the only higher genus curve that's considered in the 10 known books of the Arithmetica. Another reason that this is nice is that it's just beyond the frontier of what we can do using Shepard Coleman, strictly speaking. And so why is that? Well, this is the genus two curve, but it's Jacobian has more del Bay rank two. So just one more than what we can use Shepard Coleman for. Uh, nevertheless, Joe Weatherall and his thesis show that the set of rational points in this curve is precisely the following. And let me tell you how Weatherall did this. So this curve is a little special. So it's a genus two curve, but you'll notice if you look at the equation here, so y squared equals x to the sixth plus x squared plus one, there is an extra automorphism, right? So at least one, uh, so you look at x going to minus x in addition to the hyperelliptic involution, you have more symmetry than you would in a generic hyperelliptic curve. So indeed, this is a bi-elliptic genus two curve. And the Jacobian of this genus two curve is isogenous to a product of two elliptic curves. So what Weatherall did was to consider a collection of covering curves and applied Shabuchi Coleman on the covers and then deduced the result about his curve, about Diophantus's curve. All right, so by a cover of a curve, I mean a surjective map from a curve F onto C. And Wetherill's idea was to look at a cover, or really a collection of covering curves, such that every rational point on his curve came from a rational point upstairs or on one of the curves in the covering collection. 
then we can compute the rational points on our curve by computing the various sets of rational points in the covering collection. Now, because the Jacobian is isogenous to the product of two elliptic curves in this case, they're very nice covers that we can construct with this genus two curve. And Weatherall found some genus five curves, G1 and G2, covering this genus two curve. And then he was able to further quotient out by some automorphisms, which then gave genus three curves that were hyperelliptic. And moreover, those hyperelliptic Jacobians had ranks zero and one. And so then Shabuti Coleman kicks in and he carried out Shabuti Coleman on those genus three curves and used that to determine the set of rational points on his genus two curve. So Shabuti Coleman plus a little bit extra geometry looking at this collection of covering curves and then carrying out Shabuti Coleman upstairs is the idea that allowed Weatherall to tackle the second curve in our trilogy. All right, so taking this question a bit further, for which curves do we care about and do we want to actually compute rational points on? Uh, so there are a number of interesting questions that come from modular curves. And so maybe one uh, very nice example of this is this beautiful theorem of Mazur that tells us if we have an elliptic curve over the rationals and P uh, rational point of finite order n, then n has to be one of the following values, 1 through 10 or 12. And the idea behind this is to find the rational points on the modular curve x1 of n. So non-cuspidal rational points in x1 of n correspond to elliptic curves over the rationals with a rational point p of order n. So Mazur's theorem is equivalent to the fact that the set of rational points on x1 of n consists only of cusps if n is 11 or n is greater than or equal to 13. So here is uh, another moduli problem. So we'll look at elliptic curves of the rationals and L a prime number. And then we have a natural Galois action on the L torsion points. And if we fix the basis of our L torsion, so this is isomorphic to Z mod L cross Z mod L, we have the following residual Galois representation, rho bar EL. And we can try to understand its image. And Sayre proved that if E does not have complex multiplication, then rho bar EL is surjective for L sufficiently large. But then Sayre went on to ask if this can be made uniform. So regardless of E, does there exist an absolute constant, L naught, such that rho bar EL is surjective for every non same elliptic curve, E over the rationals, and every prime L greater than L naught? And the folklore conjecture is that taking L naught to be 37 should work. All right. So if we're trying to understand the image of this model Gower representation, uh, well, to show that it's surjective, we want to show that its image is not contained in a maximal subgroup of GL2FL. So what are these maximal subgroups? Well, we have the Burrell subgroups, the upper triangular ones, and exceptional subgroups, those with projective image A4, S4, or A5. We have the normalizers of the split Carton subgroups. So these are the ones that can be diagonalized over FL. And then the normalizers of the non-split Carton subgroups. And the idea in doing this analysis is that for a maximal subgroup G, there is a corresponding modular curve, XG over the rationals, for which the non-cuspidal rational points correspond to elliptic curves with the image of this Gal representation contained in G. So now we've translated this question about looking at these images into, well, we, we've translated this question about looking at the possible subgroups into a question about the possible rational points on these modular curves. So what do we know about SER uniformity? So in the Burrell case, uh, this was handled by Mazur, his work on rational isogenies of prime degree. The exceptional subgroups were handled by SER. The normalizers of the split Carton subgroups, this was work of Bilou and Perron. And the non-split Car Carton subgroups are much harder and essentially not much is known. So this, this is pretty wide open. Uh, what I'd like to focus on is uh, the work of Bilou Perron and then Bilou Perron Rebelledo. So they showed that the split Carton curves, their rational points are cusps and CM points 
for L greater than or equal to 11, but they couldn't say much about 13. All right, so what went wrong at 13? So a number of things went wrong at 13. Uh, in fact, they refer to 13 as a cursed level. And one thing that they use is Mazur's method for integrality of non-cuspidal rational points, which uses the following decomposition of the Jacobian. So the Jacobian of the split Cartan curve of level L is isomorphic to the Jacobian of X naught of L squared plus, which in turn is isomorphic to the Jacobian of X naught of L cross the Jacobian of X non-split of L. And Mazur's method applies whenever the Jacobian of X naught of L, so this is what J naught of L is, whenever this is not trivial. And this is true for L equals 11 and L greater than or equal to 17. And this is the first thing that goes wrong. Uh, for 13, J naught of 13 is trivial. So the first curse of the cursed curve, and there are quite a few, uh, is that the Jacobian of X split of 13 is actually isogenous to the Jacobian of X non-split of 13. And there are not any nice factors that we can take out and analyze. The Jacobian of X, not X split of 13 is absolutely simple. All right, so we said earlier, the Jacobian or the non-split Carton curves are kind of more difficult to deal with. And so the fact that the Jacobian of the split Carton curve is isogenous to the Jacobian of the non-split Carton curve of level 13 doesn't bode well for us. It kind of suggests that maybe things are somehow more difficult at level 13. But it gets worse. So uh, Virtue Baron did some very nice work on the non-split Carton curve of level 13 and the split Carton curve of level 13. She computed explicit smooth plane quartic models and showed that actually the curves are isomorphic over Q. So the curve at level 13, the split Carton curve of level 13 actually turns out to be isomorphic to the non-split Carton curve of level 13. Not just that their Jacobians are isogenous, but the curves themselves are isomorphic over Q. And there's no real good reason for this. So there's no modular interpretation of this exceptional isomorphism. Uh, and again, we said that the non-split curves are much harder. And so now we find ourselves dealing with the non-split curve of level 13. All right, so here is Ferran's model for X split of 13. So this is that curve that I showed you earlier. And so now uh, we can maybe try to analyze this curve and see what we can say about its rational points. So of course, the first thing that you might want to try is the Shabuti Coleman method. So what can we say about the rank of this, first of all? That's our third curse. So the, the rank of this Jacobian is at least three. And so we're beyond Shabuti Coleman. Uh, and there aren't any nice covers that we can construct, at least not obviously, to kind of use the second idea of whether all. So we're really out of luck here and we need to do something else. Uh, but this is exactly what Kim's method proposes. Uh, this is kind of the right sort of example to consider in Kim's method. Uh, one can possibly hope to carry out Shabuti Coleman ideas when the rank is greater than or equal to the genus using some non-abelian geometric objects and corresponding iterated Coleman integrals. So in this situation, or kind of beyond the frontier of Shabuti Coleman, we would like to construct some non-abelian geometric objects associated to our curve. Uh, so this uh, is what's often referred to as looking at Selmer varieties. So these are cut out using homology and some local conditions. And so this should kind of feel like the construction of Selmer groups and studying elliptic curves. And uh, these sum varieties give rise to a sequence of sets. Uh, so XQP1 was the first shabuchi coleman set that we were looking at, but there is a depth two set XQB2 that's cut out by these double Coleman integrals and further n-fold iterated integrals give rise to further refined sets XQPN. So the hope is that maybe we can compute the equations that these iterated Coleman integrals have to satisfy, and then we can use these now to cut out these finite sets of chaotic points and then extract rational points from these sets. That's the idea. All right, so Kim has conjectured that for n sufficiently large, the set XQPN is finite. 
And this is implied by standard conjectures like block Hato. So what do we know now? What's, what's known in practice? Well, uh, one of the first nice results in this area is due to Coates and Kim for curves whose Jacobians have CM Jacobian. Um, so for n sufficiently large, the set XQPN is finite. And Ellenberg and Hast showed that that can be extended to give a new proof of faulting's theorem. Again, um, so for n sufficiently large, we have some finiteness, and then that applies to curves whose um, curves that can be written as solvable Galois covers of P1. Uh, so both of the first two results are showing this asymptotic finiteness that there's some control dimension of Selmer varieties as n gets large, and that gives you the finiteness result that you need. Uh, in a different direction, together with Dahlgren, we showed that for curves x over the rationals with genus at least two, and the rank less than g plus the rank of neuron severity of the Jacobian minus one, then the set xqp2 is finite. And this xqp2 now is kind of this next set cut out by double integrals, and computing xqp2 is what we call quadratic Chabotie. So we would like to compute the set xqp2 because it turns out that the cursed curve satisfies this bound, uh, that the rank is less than g plus the rank of neuron severity minus one. And so if we can compute the set xqp2, then maybe we're in business and we can compute the set of rational points. All right, so more broadly, we can hope to use quadratic Chabotie to compute xqp2 uh, in the case when the rank is equal to the genus and the rank of neuron severity is greater than one. But there's some difficulty in making all this effective and implementing this on a computer to get some sensible answers at the end. So uh, the functions, you know, where do they come from? Well, it turns out that they can be expressed in terms of chaotic heights. And the idea is to move from the linear relations among these abelian integrals in the Shabuchi Coleman method to bilinear relations among these integrals. And these chaotic heights have a natural interpretation using uh, piatic differential equations, and the constants can be computed using a collection of known rational points. So there is also still a bit of luck here involved as well that you kind of need enough rational points on your curve to start off with. So not only do you need to know the rank of the Jacobian and to have some explicit work on the Jacobian as well, but your curve naturally needs to have a collection of rational points and sufficiently many to be able to start this process. All right, so just a little dictionary between the two methods, classical and quadratic Chabotie. So the Jacobian now is replaced by this non-abelian object, the Selmer variety. The integrals are now replaced by some iterated integrals, and there's some bilinear algebra of chaotic heights, replacing the linear algebra computing kernels. So to reframe what happened in classical Chabotie Coleman, uh, instead of just using the linear relations, we're going to try to use some bilinear relations as well. Let me just remind you about the linear relations. So these are among the functionals, the integral from b to x for omega regular one form in the case when the rank is less than the genus. And this gives us some obel jacobi map with base point, ajb. And what we'd like to do now is to generalize this to consider now the bilinear relations when the rank is equal to the genus. So this brings us to the definition of a quadratic Chabotie function. So this is a function theta from qp points on the curve to qp, such that on each residue disk, the map abel jacobi base point and the quadratic Chabotie function, this is given by a piatic power series. And moreover, we have an anamorphism E, a functional C, and a bilinear form B, such that for all rational points, the quadratic Chabotie function minus the bilinear form on Abel Jacobi with base point, and then slightly translated version of this, this vanishes. And we can show that a quadratic Chabotie function induces a function that vanishes on rational points and has finally many zeros. So this is how we'll compute the set XQP2. Uh, sorry to interrupt. There is a question please from Joel Rosenberg. Joel, will you please uh, ask your question? Sure. So uh, earlier in the talk, there was an obstruction to using classical Chabotie in G equals three and R equals two. Um, 
does what what is that obstruction? Does quadratic Shabbati solve this case, and is there a corresponding uh, obstruction to quadratic Shabbati? Uh, I might have misheard the question. So you were saying there is an obstruction to genus three and rank two. I thought that was the problem in Diophantus's. I thought that was the setting of, of Diophantus's problem. The, oh, okay. So yeah, in, in Diophantus's problem, it was actually a genus two curve with rank two. And so indeed, there is oh. an obstruction to using classical, but you're absolutely right. There is an obstruction to using classical Shabuti Coleman um, in genus two, rank two. Uh, Weatherall didn't use quadratic Shabuti. He had this covering collection, but you're totally right. You can apply quadratic Shabuti uh, in that scenario as well. So this condition about narrow and severity ranks uh, works in that case as well. And, uh, and in fact, um, my student, Francesca Bianchi, worked out an example uh, using quadratic Shabuti to solve Diophantus's problem again uh, and to show that it has just the rational points that Weatherall found. Thank you, Jennifer. Are there any other questions? Okay. Okay, great. All right. So in quadratic Shabuti, we need to construct this function. So we need to have some way of having this endomorphism, this functional, and we need to solve for the bilinear relationship. Uh, let me just say for this last thing, solving for the bilinear relationship is similar to solving for the linear relations in Shabuti Coleman using linear algebra. And one natural source of bilinear functions for us comes really through the theory of chiatic heights. So the fact that this is quadratic Shabuti suggests that maybe there should be some quadratic functions, some uh, quadratic functions maybe taking chiatic values. And chiatic heights are precisely the sort of tool that uh, does that for you. So that's, that's how we're going to find uh, some of these quadratic functions. All right. So to warm up, uh, before we get to the cursed curve, I thought I'd just say a little bit about how this can be used to find integral points on hyperelliptic curves, uh, in the case when the rank is equal to the genus, and then how we can extend this then to rational points on more general curves. So the little bit of theory that you need now here is the Coleman-Gross chiatic height, which is a symmetric bilinear pairing on degree zero divisors on the curve. This takes values in QP. And the height on D uh, with a principal divisor, this is zero. So this is a well-defined pairing on the Jacobian. The global height has a decomposition as a finite sum of local heights over the finite primes V. And then how do we compute each of these local heights HV? Well, there's some distinguished prime P that you're picking. This is a piatic height. So at P, there is something honestly piatic that's happening. So there's a normalized differential that you construct with respect to splitting the Hodge filtration on each one drawn. And then you compute the Coleman integral of this differential of the third kind. Away from P, this is more combinatorial, and you compute intersection multiplicities if your divisor is extended to a regular model. All right, then roughly speaking, what is happening in quadratic Shabuti is to use this decomposition of the global height h as a sum of local heights. So uh, local height at p is something really honestly piatic. It's the solution to a piatic differential equation. Uh, the local heights away from p uh, take on finitely many values on rational points. But in certain favorable cases, these are all trivial. And there are no local heights away from p to consider. And that's kind of a, a situation that we'll, we'll want to look at. So in the case of looking at integral points on curves, uh, the main idea is to first compute this local height HP as a double Coleman integral, and then to control the finite number of values that the local heights take on integral points. All right. Uh, once we have those two pieces, well, the other thing that's going on is on the left-hand side, the global height we said is a quadratic form. And we can write down a basis for the space of quadratic forms using, again, Coleman integration. So we can rewrite the global height h in terms of a basis for the space of quadratic forms. And then everything on the left is a Coleman integral. And most of what's on the right is a Coleman integral. So we move things around so that we have a Coleman integral set equal to finitely many values. And then just like Shabuti-Coleman, it mounts to this piatic calculation of looking at piatic power series 
and understanding when they can take on each of these values. All right, so that's the theorem uh, with Besser and Mueller. That in the case of a hyperelliptic curve, this can be made very explicit when the rank is equal to the genus. And you know that these linear functionals, fi, the intervals of the regular one forms omega i, are linearly independent. Then there is an explicitly computable finite set of values, s, and explicitly computable constants, alpha ij, such that the quadratic Chabotie function theta, which is a double Coleman integral, the integral of omega i omega i bar, where omega i bar is the dual under cut product pairing, uh, such that theta minus this combination of products fi fj, this takes values in this finite set s on integral points. So this theta minus alpha ij fi fj, this gives us the analog of that function that we looked at, the integral of the annihilating differential in the Chabotie Coleman method. And then we just systematically set it equal to each of the values in this finite set s, look at all the possible chaotic solutions, and then take this across the whole set s. So this now gives us the set x qp2 in the case of integral points. So we like to do something like this for rational points. But there's one main problem here is that controlling the local heights away from p is quite difficult when x is rational but not integral. So in the coleman gross setting, these local heights away from p are essentially measuring denominators. And so if you want to study your rational points, well, you need to have some sense of what the denominators look like, but this is, this is the whole thing, right? This is the entire question. We don't know uh, some absolute height bound. So this is tricky. How do we control the local heights away from P? So the workaround is to look at a quadratic Chabotie function that comes to us from a slightly different construction of chaotic heights, one due to Nekobar. And here, instead of pairing divisors, we're gonna look at the chaotic height on an associated Galois representation. So for every rational point, we can construct a chaotic Galois representation, A of X. This depends on having this data of a correspondence, a nice correspondence Z. And we have such a correspondence when the rank of neuron severity of the Jacobian is at least two. Then we're gonna make the following extra assumption that our curve has everywhere potential good reduction. Because in this case, the neck of our height uh, has the following very nice property, that the local height HV of this representation is trivial. So then there are no local heights that we need to compute. And so we're essentially done here. We, we just need to compute the local height at P. And this can, we can do using some piatic Hodge theory. So just like with the coleman gross decomposition, the neck of our piatic height has a local decomposition as a sum local height, of, uh, local height at P of the representation plus the local heights away from P. The local height at P is a locally analytic function. This will give us our quadratic, Chab quadratic Chabotie function theta. And then by assumption, since we're now going to put ourselves in the position that our curve has everywhere potential good reduction, the local heights away from P are trivial. And this will give us a quadratic Chabotie function whose bilinear pairing is now this global height H and the endomorphism is induced by this correspondence Z. So, with all of the assumptions now that we've kind of stacked on, uh, so if the rank of the Jacobian is equal to the genus, the rank of neuron severity is greater than one, the piatic closure of the Jacobian has finite index in J of QP, X has everywhere potential good reduction, and that we know enough rational points on our curve, then if we can solve the following two problems, we're in business and we can compute the quadratic Chabotie set. So we need to be able to compute the local piatic height as a piatic power series, and then evaluate the global height um, for each of the known rational points. But really, the second problem, computing the global height on each of the known rational points, is essentially the first problem. Since we have everywhere potential good reduction, computing the global height is just computing the local height at P. All right, and so the cursed curve uh, there are many things that go wrong with the cursed curve, but some nice things about the cursed curve, well, it satisfies all these conditions. And so we can check and compute the rank of neuron severity and so on. We can compute the rank of the Mordell Bay group, the Jacobian, um, and we can show that the rank of the Jacobian is three. Uh, it turns out to have enough rational points. So Galbraith 
found seven rational points and we can do a small change of coordinates to work with this model of the curve so that we can put five rational points in each of two affine patches covering the curve. Uh, since the rank of neuron severity is three, there are two independent non-trivial nice correspondences that actually give us two 17 attic heights. So we work with 17, but there are two height functions that we can write down. And so it's a little bit better than uh, just having one independent function. So having two functions now, we want to look at the intersection of the solution sets. And then to see what happens if this is precisely on the seven known rational points or if there are more rational points. All right, so the theorem, uh, this is joint work with Dogra, Mueller, Taubman, and Bonk, is that the split Carton curve of level 13 has just the seven rational points that Galbraith found earlier. So this completes the classification of rational points on the split Carton curves that uh, was started by Bilou Perron Rebelledo. And then thanks to the work of Bertu Baron, uh, since we know that the split Carton curve of level 13 is isomorphic to the non-split Carton curve of level 13, we get for free that we know the rational points in the non-split Carton curve of level 13 as well. There's seven rational points there. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jennifer. Let's unmute.